I gotta start secretly recording Keith when he doesn't think the microphone is on. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, <laughs> that was good. I enjoyed li you listing out all the actresses you would have sex with. <laughs> no, that's not what happened. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hey you and welcome. Uh, my name is Mike, and I'm once again joined by uh, Keith for another episode. Of the other that oh man, you guys don't want to know what we were talking about before I pressed record. It was very innocent. Was it? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so as you can tell, mm. as you can tell by his dirty, despicable. <laughs> Thoughts being recorded forever. Aired out for all. Yeah. Um, joining again by Keith. Hello. Hello. Hello, Keith. How are you today? What's going on? Great. Yeah. Excited to be Good. here. Excited to be back at it again. Mm. New year, new podcast. You are brimming with excitement. I can see it in your eyes. You came here, sparkles, know, sparkles yeah. in your eyes. You skipped in the door. You brought that, uh, that podcast glow. Yeah, exactly. Ready for the pod glow. <laughs> um, so what? Else? What's what's going on? You know what, Keith? What's going on in your life? And let's let's talk here. So you know, uh, you record a podcast. You have a regular job. You got you're doing the family life. You mm -hmm. got a, you got a wife and a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, doing your thing, working your job, and then you come over to old Mike in the evening, and we have our we have our little podcast. We have our little podcast session. Yeah. Um, we, we shoot the shit. We do shoot. Have a couple shit. of beers every now and again, but no, still, still doing the dry. You're still the doing dry, dry January. Yeah. I'm drinking a um a delicious can of, of diet Coca Cola. I'm trying to watch my figure. Uh, hey, listen, I'm 33 now. You know, I'm you gotta watch those. You gotta, 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 you gotta watch those cows. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You gotta, gotta keep it tight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, keep it tight for the fans. Keep it tight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I'm you're not drinking either in solidarity. You are. Yeah, I know. Keith texted me. He was like, "Pints, smiley face." I said, "Alas." Nope. No, no, <laughs> not tonight. Can't have Carl's Rick. No Carl's Rick for Keith. I know, yeah. You're drinking a... a Probably the best beer in the world. No, it's <laughs> awful. I hate Carlsberg. Do you? I do. I really don't like it. I, really, I, I think it's just, it tastes like shit. I like the price. For, for, <laughs> yeah. for some reason, it's the cheapest. <laughs> for some reason, it's... What do you mean for some reason it's cheap? You're only drinking it because it's the cheapest. <laughs> I always go with cheap stuff. Yeah, I know. You're cheap bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to spend my money elsewhere. You're but, actually not really a man who buys buys things very often. You're not. You're not a. You're not a very materialistic person. I would say. No. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm really not. Yeah. I don't worry about my money. Uh, the bank. Put money in the bank. That's probably the most exciting thing I do. But there you go. Fair yeah. enough. I love saving. Yeah. There you go. Great little saver. Yeah. You know, just looking. Oh, how much money do I have? Squirreling away for a rainy day. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so what's been going on? Uh, what's going on with you? Any any stories? Any mad stories for the fans? You know, they all want. To... Oh, by the way, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this on the podcast because it's kind of a spoiler. <laughs> but uh, so on the subreddit, the yeah. that chapter subreddit or slash chapter, someone posted. Somebody found your Instagram. Did they? Yeah. Ow. <laughs> I have no idea how. Some freaking weirdos out there. Some sleuth. Yeah, they fair, fair no. They, I think you. they posted. A, yeah, honestly, fair play to you. Um, but yeah, they they did. They were like, "Is this Keith?" <laughs> and it was your Instagram. Oh, so I did. Okay, yeah. So you. I don't follow you. You found me. So they did. I don't. I don't follow you on Instagram mm. specifically because I'm like, yeah, okay. If I follow you, it'll make, like you can go through who I'm following. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they'll be able. They. I don't know how they found you. Yeah. Um. But then they they found pictures of you and a, it was a picture of you a picture of a which is how i describe you a picture right. of a cat oh yeah black cat and salem. then yeah. uh we've decided, decided on salem we, we, we decided with salem yeah and uh I, right. I really i really wanted philip but, uh, but i like black philip i think that's great me too but my daughter's stuck on salem that's fair so it's like right. to, yeah we can, we compromised and we went she with, can win this she wants round <laughs> I actually want to bring it up because it's kind of funny. Um, so this is for the Redditors out there. Okay, where is it? Have I found the Majestic Keith? Uh, is what somebody posted here. All right, here you go. See? That's you. Hey. They did. Uh, well, nailed so, it. Well done. Congrats to E-A-M. E E-I-M. E uh, they did. That was him. You are correct. Let me see what the comments, we see what the comments say. I need to actually start being a bit more active. Oops. On what? Instagram. Because I, I got it. Uh, yeah. Like, I should probably get it. And then I haven't really done much on it. Yeah, no, you don't really post on Instagram. Anyway, so for those uh, who are out there I'll who want to follow him, uh, I mean, don't fucking run out the door. And... <laughs> it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not that exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. I don't know why you didn't put your Instagram on private. Anyway, it's like almost like you wanted to be found. Uh, maybe it is. Have you, did you even check your Instagram? Does anybody need to start following you? I, uh, I actually didn't even think. I said, I said, oh, probably should have put it on private. Uh, didn't think about it. Probably should. Okay, so here's here's what it says. So it's, it it says, "Have I found a majestic Keith?" And then a picture of your Instagram, and then a picture of who you follow, and one of them is, is me. And then it says, "Greetings all." After weeks and weeks of rigorous <laughs> research and debate, 
<laughs> I believe my partner. Okay, so it wasn't this person. Uh, it's their partner. Okay. okay. Uh, may have located the face of the wild, mysterious, and majestic Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if only you knew Keith. <laughs> I hear you're barking, big dog. Where's my logic? No one's ever used those words to describe me. So yeah. Thank so, you for that. <laughs> on the Here's the first. On the podcast, it's mentioned that Keith has recently made an Instagram, and his face is in the profile pic, and he has no posts at the time. The second point is this bearded beauty <laughs> is following that chapter. And then surely, then it says, surely this must be the one. The okay. one is capitalized. Okay, okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, That's so funny. I do, but I do have a picture of the cat up there as well. So, And then uh, the top rated comment is by Marty. Uh, 61 says, perhaps nice investigating or as Mike would say, look at you. Hey, look at you. Uh, yeah. Um, one person did say, actually, in your, in your, in your, I don't know if you'd say this defense. I don't think it's defense. I, I think fucking put you up everywhere. Uh, it says, I think if he wanted his face shown, he would have given Mike permission to show it. Please don't take offense, but this seems like overstepping to me. That's uh, by one person. What do you think of that? I don't care. Keith doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Post his face everywhere. Um, and yeah, somebody actually says there's a black cat in his yard on the podcast uh, you, that you mentioned it. Mm. Father Gregory Rasputin. That's what one person called you. Rasputin. Yeah. Uh, to, be, to be fair, you're not far off. You know? <laughs> and of course, you have a Guinness in your thing and you always talk about Guinness. That was a Christmas Guinness when we were drinking. On, uh, oh, was yeah, it? Yeah, when we actually, went in for a How the fuck? Christmas of course, party. people are going to... Literally, there's three pictures on. One is a Guinness, one is a black cat, and one is you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> With it. With long hair and tattoos, as I described. I know, I kind of put it those three photos like that's it that's all i got man <laughs> well there you there you go there you go folks oh shit didn't close it. um you close your laptop yeah, so, like, we haven't yeah. even started the podcast. Know, like, <laughs> my job here is done keith has been outed he is out of the out of the non-identified closet hey guys all right okay before you get into this i wonder if you know, a, not a complaint I hear about... <laughs> I'm just fucking talking, man. <laughs> I think I actually feel like it's the fact that I'm not drinking is making me... More chitty chat. More chitty chatty and more yeah. fucking scatterbrained. Um, you know, a common complaint I see about podcasts is mm. that people... The podcaster hosts don't get into it. Mm. A lot of people want, okay, this podcast is about XYZ. Mm -hmm. Begin. Yeah. Start talking. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We take a very different attitude in that chapter podcast. We like to shoot shit. We do like to shoot shit. You know, yeah. we like to. We, we're not just you know your 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 narrators. Mm. You know, we we're your buddies. You know, yeah, we're, sh we're shooting the shit. Let's create a vibe of we're in the pub chatting away, yeah. and you're there listening. Yeah. Uh, also, also, I feel it gets me into it easier as well. Yeah. Instead of just kind of because sometimes I I arrive here and it's like hey come, let's let's get into it and then we sit down. It's very hard to kind of just start. We're on. We're oh, I need, I need to, I need to warm up the Ease engines. In. You know, yeah. I need to warm up the cannon. That's it. That's you it. You know. Uh, yeah. All right, there you go. That killed about nine minutes. <laughs> <That's gonna do laughs> <it>. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Hey, you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old one, we're going back there on the mice <laughs> for a pair of mysteries. Uh, today's story is actually about two kind of sort of mysteries. Mm. Um, I guess you could say. Some would say solved. Oh, yeah. Sort of half solved, I'd say. Mm. Mm. Well, well, very well, well put, we'll get, into, we'll get into it. Yeah. Very good. Uh, these stories have confounded investigators throughout the last century, and maybe, just maybe, they'll confound you too. So let's get into it. We have two stories today. Both are linked by Australia. So you know what I mean? Put into your mind koalas, kangaroos, didgeridoos, other all funny like, words. All that good stuff. There you go. Other all of... Would you like to come to Australia? Yeah, I'd, lo I'd yeah. love to go to Australia. I've always wanted to go. Yeah. Um, the videos of the giant spiders mm. are enough to put me off mm. and make me fucking not want to go. But I would love to go. It looks like a beautiful country. Uh, I like... It. The people seem pretty pretty badass. Mm. They're all hot as well. Do you ever notice Australians are like sexy people? Yeah, well, I, yeah, there's a little bit different. I think though, they're all descendants of criminals. Yeah. So yeah. literally, it's only the strong survive. That's it. That's so it, yeah. I think that's probably why they're just like... They're like genetically bred to be yeah. like just like tall yeah. and strong. Also, when you're just looking around where, where we live with a bunch of spud heads, you know. Yeah, I know, I know. We're just We've like never the seen the sun. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Anything. I know. Not well, like, I always it's say, a low know, bar. <laughs> yeah, I always say all the good-looking Irish people were taken away by the Vikings. That's why the <laughs> Norwegians true. are also hot-looking. They true. stole That's all true. our hot people yeah. a thousand years ago. Left all the ogles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, no, you can stay. <laughs> <laughs> you're not welcome on the boat. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's some room over there. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. You, you can stay here. We're not. We're not going to destroy your town. You're fine. <laughs> So our story begins on August 11th, 1994, when a man named Mark, Mark Patterson and his small crew were out for a spot of fishing on the Hawkes, <clears throat> on the Hawkesbury, Hawkesbury <laughs> River, just north of Sydney. 
Hawkesbury River, by the way, real big, surrounded by jungle on all sides, and it looks pretty cool. I looked up some pictures and videos of Hawkesbury River. It looks like a a jungle river, kind of like straight out of a video game, mm. if you want to put it that way. And I just did. He was excited to pull in a haul, much heavier than usual. Mark had no idea he was about to open the lid on a mystery that would bamboozle Australia for decades. Expecting to either see a net bulging with fish, trash, or maybe even a giant squid or a shack, Mark got none of the above. Maybe it was the Hawkesbury River Monster, one of Australia's strangest cryptids. Well, this yeah. just took a sudden turn, folks. <laughs> Tell me more. Yeah, supposedly it has two sets of flippers, a lengthy snake-like neck, and four arses. <laughs> <laughs> no, that last part's a joke. But it basically looks like the Loch Ness Monster. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, supposedly, but like there's Aboriginal rock art over between like three and 4,000 years old wow. in the area that describes creatures. So, you know, who knows? Honestly, though, like if a new cryptid is actually going to be found, my money is for it to be found in Australia. Well, they yeah. They have some mad creatures out there. So. All the weirdest creatures. They're going to find something fucking bizarre out there. Mm. Something that's like shouldn't be alive. Yeah. But somehow it is. That's very true. Keith, you once again, with your random fact, you knocked it out of the park. <laughs> So, uh, no, uh, Mark Peterson did not pull up the Hawkesbury uh, River river Monster. I bet he wish he did. I bet he wish he did, too. I'm yeah. sure he fucking wishes he did. Because, it, but what he did pulled it out. It took him a few moments to, to figure out what exactly he was looking at. It was a mix of hard right angles and squishy pale clumps. Then, it hit him. What Mark was looking at, what they had just pulled out of the river, was a large metal crucifix not a cross a crucifix it's actually a fun fact i did not know this but it's not a crucifix unless it comes with a person attached mm. so it's a cross without a person it's a crucifix with the person most commonly jesus yeah but mm -hmm. in this case it wasn't jesus it was someone else right okay fixed to the crude rusted structure was the unmistakable shape of a human body mostly wrapped in black plastic it was pale bloated from substantial time underwater and badly decomposed, but it was certainly a real human body. What Mark could make out was the sight of a long, thick bone sticking out of the mess of plastic and sea scum. This crucifix structure had been welded into a torture device. Dude, that's the stuff of nightmares, isn't it? Grim. Peterson, once he calmed down, called the police, and crime scene investigators and forensics came to study this gruesome find. Once they'd managed to confirm the remains were 100% human, the body and the crucifix were passed on to pathologist Dr. Christopher Lawrence. Lawrence removed the black plastic wrapping, stripping away large chunks of hair and fatty tissue as he went. The corpse had been secured to the structure with orange rope and twisted metal wire. The only items in this John Doe's pockets were an open packet of cigarettes and a lighter, neither of which were any use in identifying who he was. Lawrence's investigation revealed several key details about the victim. It was a man, I think they call him blokes in Australia. Blokes and Sheilas. Blokes and Sheilas, there you go. Caucasian, likely of Mediterranean or European descent and had been aged somewhere between 21 and 46 years old. That, that wide an age range, uh, well, that's how badly decomposed the remains were. He also determined that the man stood at just 5 foot 2 or 5 foot 4 in stature. He was a short king, and his official cause of death was blunt force trauma. Though critically, Lawrence couldn't confirm whether the man had been killed before or after being tied to the crucifix. The level of decomposition meant that efforts to obtain fingerprints were fruitless and yielded nothing but indistinct smudges. Even trying to get a solid DNA sample for testing against databases was a no-go. Any hope of a speedy resolution to the mystery was kicked into the bin when searches of the missing person's database turned up no results. It's important to note her DNA, by the way, back at this stage, it was in its infancy and was only just becoming more widely used and had recently been recognized as legally admissible. I went down a bit of a rabbit hole. You did? Looking, <laughs> you did. Looking into the decomposition. Tell me more. Of bodies. Okay. Covered from water and... Ooh, it's a... Uh, so first of all, it's gross. And Yeah, I think yeah. I've seen some mm. pictures online uh, of what hum water does to the human body and uh, you don't want to know. It's, it's pretty... Nasty. Like, yeah. it, they don't even look like bodies anymore. Mm. But uh, I found that forensic pathologists, they actually, they made major improvements recently in the ability to get fingerprints from even advanced decayed corpses. 
The process is called Thanatopraxy, uh, which comes from Thanatos, which is the god of death in Greek mythology, which is kind of cool. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's still a, a fairly young discipline in funeral homes to embalm bodies. Mm-hmm. But uh, from a forensic point of view, their focus is mainly on the reconstruction of the original appearance of the bodies, uh, which have advanced decay. And the method is done by like, removing fluids from tissues, restoring their original tension and volume. Uh, but when applied to the hands, it can produce high quality fingerprints. But I still feel in this case, like this is like years later, they kind of yeah, yeah. I still kind of feel in this case, it was so far gone. I don't think they're going to get anything off it. Mm-hmm. This body was like severely decomposed. We'll get to it. But yeah, you thought it had been in the water for, for a while. So investigators next go to was what little remained of the victim's clothing. An everything Australian brand polo shirt in medium and a no sweat branded sweatpants. Unfortunately, they just happened to be some of the most popular and generic brands sold in Australia and didn't narrow down the search at all. Though investigators did get some helpful information back from a study of the metal structure, or to be more exact, some tiny particles attached to the cross. Professor Donald Anderson of the School of Biological Sciences found that the structure and the body had not been under the water for more than a year. I think he has made it between six months and a year. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I imagine the body wouldn't be there anymore if it was under. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, even it's surprising that even after six months, there, there, like there was still something there. Something there. You yeah, think like yeah. fish would have like you know added it and shit. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were definitely like I know from looking into it, like they they definitely gave it a good go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They had to be chumps. <laughs> yeah. A cast and forensic reconstruction of the victim's face was created, and for a while, the man's image was everywhere. The unidentified man soon gained the name The Rack Man, and that's how he'd be known for over 25 years. As is usually the case, the publicity brought in an offer of a cash reward, and as that usually goes, authorities, they got no shortage of tips from randos, psychics, and just well-meaning members of the public. Despite the reward eventually hitting 100,000 Australian dollars, no one could offer anything that led to a positive identification. Did you see the reconstruction of the face? I will now. Uh, it's kind of horrifying. But it, it also kind of... Oh, wait, of... no, I think I have. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's very creepy. It kind of strangely looks like the drummer from The Who a bit as well. <laughs> you know, Keep, Keep Moon. Yeah, yeah, li- yeah, I th- yeah. It's I think it's the eyebrows and the hair, but yeah. It's very weird. Creepy. I mean, I mean, I think it's just the fact that it's like a wax face. Mm, uh, yeah. that'll, that'll do it. But, uh, yeah. Weird. Go and take a look. It's weird. The weird thing, however, is that this was clearly a very intentional and well-planned-out murder. Whoever had done this likely had not acted alone. In fact, investigators were pretty certain, right from the very beginning, that they were looking for multiple suspects. After all, the victim might have been slight of build, but it still would have likely taken more than one person to create the rack or the crucifix, let alone kill the man and fix him to the steel structure. The, the, the weight and the size of the crucifix meant that to have it transported and dumped into the river, complete with a man attached, no one person could have or would have managed to be able to do it themselves. Police were definitely looking for multiple people. One really worrying detail that might seem minor, but is actually considered a key detail, is the level of welding involved. You see, There's a big difference between a hobbyist and a pro when it comes to welding. It's a skill that's easy to learn, takes a long time to master. Whoever welded the crucifix had done a pro job on it, which kind of just makes this seem a little bit more creepy, I think, Mm. that there was someone who was a master making this thing. I mean, if if it was like done like shittily. Kind of thrown together. Thrown together, lashing it up like last minute. Now it's like, oh no, this is like planned out. And like Purposely they, done. Yeah, and they do really took their time to make this. Like that body wasn't going anywhere. The crucifix, it was kind of measured to size mm-hmm. for the body. Like it was perfectly for really, a, yeah, for a, for a short guy. Yeah, yeah, and it also included some rebar in the middle that was kind of welded in the structure, like an L shape. Okay. So that was to prevent any the body from falling off. So you had like you had the the, the flat structure of the crucifix, and then the middle was this L shape. So yeah. the body was kind of. Stuck and then it was also like it was tied down with, with wire and bits yeah. of rope around it, but yeah, that body wasn't going anywhere. Wow. Due to it being the early 90s, of course, two of the first early targets were A, gangs, and B, do 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 do, Satanists, baby! Yes. Hell yeah! <laughs> the moral panic around youths listening to the devil's music and uh, being inspired to get all stabby was very rife at this time, and gang violence had been on the rise around the world. 
Once again, the investigators uh, and the investigation went nowhere, and detectives were left a little more frustrated than when they had started. The very nature of the case, with several people involved, pointed to a conspiracy. It's a goddamn fucking conspiracy of some kind. Usually in these cases, it's just a matter of time till someone slips up and says something they shouldn't. But this time, no one was talking. A very bizarre and creepy mystery. Mm, those goddamn Satanist welders, huh? Mm. It's very, uh, very niche sub of Satanist, but very dangerous. Yeah, I mean, sounds like something Satanists would do. Yeah, yeah. Make cool shit. I feel, yeah, I feel so. It's, it's, it's funny, like, it never actually turns out to be the Satanist in a lot yeah. of these cases. Uh, but did, there actually was one... Uh, there was a, a known case in Ireland uh, where we had our very own satanic murder. With the crucifixion and shit? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it, it was, Tell me more. What is that? What's that? So there was, uh, it was in, so a seven-year-old boy, he was found dead. He was lashed in Jesus. crucifix fa- uh, fashion to the rafters of an attic in Dublin in 1973 uh, out in Palmerstown, which is near the Phoenix Park. Um, which is like West Dublin. Yes, yeah. Just yeah. for peop- most people who are listening to this are probably not familiar or not familiar with Dublin. You don't know Palmerston? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but beneath the hanging body, there was there was like an altar on which there was a chalice and communion hosts which were laid out. And a 16-year-old boy um, who was obsessed with the occult, he pleaded guilty to the murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. Uh, very interesting story. He was just obsessed with Satan and shit. So he killed another boy, brought him to his attic and crucified him. Yeah, it's, yeah so he was, obs- he was obsessed with, with like anything with the occult he started off with like neighbors dogs and cats would go missing oh the usual serial killer shit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Just, like torturing these animals uh-huh. and then he just leveled up and then uh-huh. he brought out his it was one of his neighbors his mother was out working so he said that he'd babysit uh-huh. and he brought him out and killed him and then hung him in a crucifix form up in the rafters in his attic wow uh, yeah. and what his parents came home were like what you doing up there well, yeah, there was there was like an investigation went out and oh, like, for a missing kid, for a missing kid, and the guard he found it, yeah, wow. oh, the, the the police, you know, yeah, but uh, they found the evidence. Holy shit, it's wild, yeah, effed up, yeah, yeah, that's effed yeah. in the B. Mm. Mad old case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I don't think it was him who did this one, but you never I don't know. Think so. yeah. You never know. You never know. An early front runner for the identity of the man behind the mystery was Joe Viviano. Viviano was the right height and age and had even been said to resemble the facial reconstruction by several people who knew him. Better yet was that Viviano had also previously been convicted of drugs-related offenses, so he could maybe link this to a gang. Maybe he pissed off the wrong gang and they literally crucified him. Viviano had been missing since being last seen in the Dremoyne suburb of Sydney. It was all looking good, and the police were hopeful to clear things up by comparing results from a forensic odontologist. Uh, by the way, I had never heard of the term a forensic odontologist. And a forensic odontologist, I'm bringing out the pointer here, classic heat <laughs> style. Did you know? There goes that finger. <laughs> yeah. A uh, forensic odontologist is the person uh, brought in to identify folk via dental records. Mm. I actually would have thought it was a dentist who would do it, but no. Uh, it's a forensic odontologist. There Although maybe they're a dentist and they odontologist in their spare time. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Bit of pocket change the weekend. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. a bit of cash in hand. Yeah. You know, you never know. <laughs> But however, the records couldn't be found of Viviano's original, like, teeth. So finally, they tested what little DNA they had from the unidentified victim against Viviano's and came back with a... It was not him. And the investigation was right back at square one. Another strong theory in the gangland vein, the identity of the John Doe, was believed it could be, in fact, Christopher Dale Flannery. Flannery had become somewhat infamously known as Mr. Rent-A-Kill, a nickname he certainly didn't earn by exterminating rats. Or did he? See, Flannery had earned himself a reputation as an enforcer and hitman for hire, and had been alleged to be behind several high-profile murders in Australia. Those murders included a barrister, a lawyer, and an undercover drug squad detective, so pretty hardcore targets, as you can imagine. And, as you also can probably imagine, Flannery was on a lot of people's shit list, and it wouldn't have been the greatest shock to have him turn up dead. After escaping conviction on several occasions, it seems that in May 1985, Flannery got on the side of one too many bad guys, and narrowly survived an assassination attempt that also targeted his family. That's not something you do to a dangerous guy like Flannery, without, you know, the intention to make sure you get him. Flannery disappeared after he reached out to a former employer and fellow top-line badman George Freeman. Flannery was apparently on his way to see Freeman in a taxi when he vanished. 
Whether something happened before, after, or during that fateful taxi trip was never known and may never be known. And some proposed that the discovery of the Rackman had finally revealed Mr. Rentakill's final resting place. It was a genuine and solid theory that a lot of people sincerely expected to plan out. This guy had gone on a lot of people's shit lists, he'd been in a lot of gangs, a lot of stuff like that, and something this dramatic wouldn't be that out of place. After all, Flannery had enough enemies with considerable means and motive to be able to have something like this done. It would also explain the sheer vindictive nature of the killing. It was all looking good until Flannery's dental records came in. They're the forensic odontologist. <laughs> you, you said, don't mind if I do. Another job for me, folks. And, well, nope. Did not match. Dental records did not match. The theory was done, dusted, and the investigation had to start all over again. I'm not sure if it was related to gangland killing. Like, there definitely was a level of professionalism with this crime, but I, I know I kind of feel with ganglands it's to send, like, a message. Mm. To, like, don't, don't do it again. Where, like, I don't know why they would go through all this effort to stage such an elaborate scene and then also hide the body so no one would ever find it. You're jumping ahead. We will, we will, we will, we will come back to this. Okay. okay. We'll come back to this. Uh, another promising lead seemed to be that of 22-year-old Stephen Colin Bryant. Bryant had visited a neighbor two days before Christmas 1993 and apparently agreed to join his friends, James and Christine, for Christmas dinner. Only Stephen would never arrive. Actually, in fact, Stephen was never seen again. Though he lived alone and it wasn't unusual for him to go several days without contacting anyone, the fact that he missed the appointed Christmas lunch had alarm bells ringing over the jingle bells right away. But it wasn't until Valentine's Day 1994, over a month later, that Stephen was actually reported missing. The subsequent investigation found Stephen's house in good order and it didn't seem as though Stephen had been intending to go away for a long time, with clothes still in his wardrobe, food still in his cupboard. The phone bill and utilities were also active up until, well, Stephen went missing. Though he hadn't accessed his bank account since even earlier in December 1993 on the 16th, so how long he'd actually been missing, nobody really knows. Police have said that they are no closer to the truth behind Stephen's vanishing, nothing has been seen or heard from, and there were hopes that the Rackman would solve the mystery. Honestly, until very recently, Stephen was considered a strong possibility. But the last possibility that stood long time neck and neck with Stephen Bryant, that the remains belonged to Max Tanchevsky. 37 years old at the time of his disappearance, Tanchevsky hadn't been seen since January 1993, when he'd been seen with his then-girlfriend in Newtown, Sydney. Max, as it turned out, was something of a degenerate gambler, and would often walk around with large amounts of cash on him. The last time he was seen alive, he was carrying $1,800, having recently withdrawn the money from his bank accounts. At Max, he had a habit of heading off to the Gold Coast for frequent gambling spurges, and would have inevitably roll back, sometimes with winnings, more often than not, with nothing. And that's exactly how his partner expected this latest trip to end, but more and more days passed and there was no sign of Max. Like Stephen, Max was never seen again and no one knew what happened to him. He was known to have several debts to various unsavory people, just as you'd expect a man with a severe gambling addiction to have. So what likely happened either, as I said, he didn't win or he did win. Both of which are very dangerous possibilities when you're dealing with um, people involved in gambling. So for the last decade, Bryant and Tanchevsky were the candidates most likely to have suffered the gruesome death. After 24 years of investigation, alongside huge advancements in DNA, the mystery, or at least part of the mystery, was finally solved when samples taken at the time of the discovery of the remains were finally tested with modern techniques. And it turns out, one of the police's guesses was right the entire time. In August 2018, Deputy State Coroner for New South Wales, Paul McMahon, officially ruled that the remains belonged to none other than Max Tanchevsky. That's where the story ends, uh, for now at least. There is little else publicly known about Tanchevsky. The most common theory is the obvious one, that he got himself into debt with the wrong people, and, well, they decided to make an example out of him to dissuade anyone else from doing the very same. But, as you just mentioned, my dear friend, the obvious problem with that theory is that, well, there's a couple. One is that, again, numerous people would have known 
um, about this, about what had happened to Max, and nobody ever said anything. Also, as he said, if it was gang-related, he owed them money and a gang wanted to make an example out of him. Horrific death. And they kept it secret. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Crucifix. Yes. Mm. Throwing it in a river where nobody would find it. You put that up in the fucking center of town. Right. Like yeah, Mexican yeah. cartel chopping heads off and hanging them on light posts. Yeah. They videos and put it online. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like, we'll kill you in a gruesome, horrible way to make an example out of you and tell no one what we did. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This sounds more like the work of like... I don't know, just some sick son of a bitch who did this for his own personal pleasure or something. Because, I mean, you know, it doesn't seem like it was for the masses. That's what I thought as well. But then also, like, there is that point of, like, there's so much to it to, for, for just one person. Mm. So, like, you're like a syndicate of serial killers, you know? I mean, yeah. I think it is possible. I mean, okay, it could technically be one person with mm. great efforts. Yes. Yeah. You know, if they were planning this for a long time, someone mm. who really wanted, like, this is something super personal really wanted to hurt Max Tanchevsky. Max, I don't know, did something to him, did something to somebody he loved, who knows? Mm. Again, not a lot is really known about Max, so maybe yeah. he was a real piece of shit who yada, yada, yada. This is like um like that law-abiding citizen yeah, movie yeah. with um your man, Trudor. Jared, Jared Butler. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, maybe this is like one of those he planned it out for months building yeah, yeah, this yeah. thing. Could have just been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or it could, maybe somebody was just testing it out, you know? Mm. Was using him as an old guinea pig. Who knows? With very little currently being known about his life, before his remains were found in the Hawkesbury River, suspects are non-existent. Maybe one day there will be a breakthrough and we'll have a why to add to the who. Yeah, when when it was announced that the mystery had been solved after 24 years... They didn't receive the fanfare that they thought they would from the public. I thought yeah, they were like were having like balloons and fireworks. Hey, everybody, yeah, like, look at you this. Guys, you did it. Yeah. But it was like, but who did it? It's like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. As I said, like one, one of the theories, if it is part of a gang, maybe someone will flip. We'll mm. find out at some point. But uh, yeah, I don't think there's any reason to celebrate just yet. Yeah. yeah. It's a wild one. It's a wild one. Yeah, it's terrifying. And now let's move on to story number two we have today. This is is like this little mini episode Mm. we're doing here. I was talking about two little ones here instead of our usual one big one. Next episode will be one big one. But now we're talking about two little ones. And part two of this episode is the Pajama Girl mystery. This one, it's again a mystery, kind of, sort of mystery. Mm. Uh, Let's get into it. So for our second Aussie mystery, we're staying in New South Wales. And once more, we begin with a discovery that likely changed the lives of everyone involved. Though this one is a good bit older. See, on September 1st, 1934, a young farmer named Tom Griffith was walking along Howlong Road, which a quiet country road, think middle of nowhere, it's barely more than a dirt road, fields on either side. It's three and a half hours north of Melbourne. And he was accompanied by his family's newly acquired bull. When, as he was walking along this road on a quiet, sunny morning, the sight of a hessian bag, a burlap sack, sticking out of a culvert by the side of the road caught his eye. I'm sure uh, those of you who've watched or listened to enough of that chapter know by now that nothing good ever comes from looking in a bag you'll find abandoned. Even in previous episodes of the podcast, we've talked about bags. No, it's no good, folks. Don't touch (laughs) bags. But uh, our simple farm boy wasn't so jaded. And he was like, what's that in? He went over, had a goo inside. Whatever he expected to find, maybe candy. Mm. Well, that thought was punted out of his mind when he came face to face with a young woman staring right back at him. All around the horrific finding, the air was thick with the smell of kerosene and singed hair. A witness local to the area reported that they had seen a fire in the area on the 29th of August, two days before. It's a rural area, and with the body being found on September 1st at around 9am, it's likely the fire the witness saw was indeed the bag and body still alight. Luckily for investigators, a strong downpouring of rain that evening saved the body from being completely obliterated. The body was taken to the medical examiner and, uh, well, examined. It was quickly apparent that the woman had suffered horrifically prior to ending up where she was found. After removing a towel that had been wrapped around the woman's head, the examiner found that that her skull had been almost caved in. The only small mercy being that she was dead before she had been set on fire. 
The medical examiner also found a small caliber bullet, likely a, a 22, lodged in the woman's throat. Regardless, he determined that it probably wasn't a fatal shot, and it was in his opinion that the sustained and vicious beating was what actually killed her. Police put it out that they had an unidentified woman, slim, around 5'2", aged between 20 and 30 with brown hair. The most uniquely identifying thing about the woman was her clothes. She appeared to be wearing yellow silk, Chinese style pajamas with red detailing. Though owing to the fire that had ravaged her body, not much remained. Oh man, that like taps into all my my fears. Mm. <laughs> I, like very claustrophobic. That's oh, horrifying. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, don't know that at all. That's not a good way to go, being thrown, tossed in the sack, and then yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, not a good not way. Not good. Go. Let's no. not dwell on that too. Long, yeah, no. <laughs> it's pretty pretty dark. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. One thing that was obvious was that the woman had been killed somewhere else before her body was dumped and set on fire. So, not only did investigators not have a motive, suspect, victim ID, they didn't even have the scene of the murder. What the police decided to do was rather, it was pretty interesting. You gotta, hey, fair, fair play to you, you know what I mean? Um, they came up with a very interesting idea to try and get attention to identify this woman and hopefully solve her brutal murder. Decided to make the corpse into an attraction. Genuinely, this was well before the advent of DNA and modern forensics, so the police knew that the best shot they had at identifying the woman was simply to have someone come forward who recognized her and could tell them. So, <laughs> rather than just like taking a picture and putting it in a newspaper, uh, they refused to allow the body to be buried, and instead, they preserved the body by freezing it solid and having it put on display at Sydney University's medical school. Again, why not just take pictures of her face, put it in all the newspapers? Right, yeah. Rather than, G'day, have a look at that. Right, it's a body. It's a frozen body, you don't believe it, mate. I don't, and I know, like, they kind of struggled to keep her fucking pose as well. Yeah. Like, again, as you said, just take a photograph. Yeah, I, I mean, do do they get a lot of tourists and, uh, you know, uh, fucking rubberneckers at the Sydney University's medical school? Like, is it just anybody can just walk in? Sure, they did after this. <laughs> yeah, well, hell yeah, yeah. Although it seemed like a totally crackpot and unnecessarily macabre thing to do, uh, it actually kind of worked. Sometime after the body had become a bit of a tourist destination, out of the blue, police got a call telling them what they believed the name of the corpse to be. Florence Linda Agustin, known as Linda. That name would come up again and again throughout the investigation. When it was first raised, the name meant little, but soon more and more people recognized the body as, as being Linda Agostini. Authorities pulled her dental records, and to their shock, they didn't match. They were similar, but Linda had two fewer fillings than this Jane Doe, and so Linda Agostini was soon ruled out, even though people kept coming forward saying, that's Linda. The weeks and the months that followed, Images of the body did appear in newspapers, which was now always preceded by Pajama Girl. That, that's what she was known as now, the Pajama Girl. You got the Rack Man and the Pajama Girl. Many of the articles involved fantastical speculation, seemingly based solely on the fact that the woman had been wearing exotic Chinese-style pajamas. This led to a whole oh, mystery, it has to be some kind of you know, spy novel. Mm. The horrific tragedy even became somewhat of a cautionary tale with the usual, you know, conservative speculation that she'd suffered the fate of a loose woman and that, uh, you know, this is what, what else did she expect would happen? All that, that kind of shit. Were they saying that she was a loose woman because she was wearing pajamas? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is she that was... what, because of these exotic pajamas? I probably, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know. As soon as any woman dies, it's just victim blaming, the usual shit. On the other side, though, an equal amount of press was based on the woman's exotic beauty. The photos given to the newspapers were, were doctored to make the girl appear more alive. They wanted that she was a real head turner, I guess. Um, so there you go. I still find it mad that they were freezing the body and displaying it. Yeah. Um, however, this is it's not the only time in history that they used to do that. So in 19th century Paris, uh, the morgue had become one of the city's most popular tourist attractions. Mm. In fact, by the end of the 19th century, the morgue attracted so many visitors that nearly every Paris guidebook mentioned it. Originally, the morgue, like it served as, it, it served the purpose of allowing friends and family to identify unidentified bodies. But very few visitors actually arrived with the intention of searching for a missing person. 
the more gruesome or mysterious the cause of death, the greater number of tourists came to view this person's body. One history professor wrote, the morgue served as a visual auxiliary to the newspaper, staging the recently dead who had been sensationally detailed by the printed world. Whenever the newspapers reported on an unknown decapitated person or a bloody trunk on display, tens of thousands <laughs> of people would flock to the morgue to see it. Really was nothing to do back then. You re- yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've, I've seen drawings of what the morgue looked like and it was, it was kind of like a, a museum of corpses. Mm. So they had the exhibition room, which held up to about 50 visitors at a time. Uh, two rows of corpses, they lay on rock slabs behind. How many bodies would they have? In the like at a time, it's like ten. Uh, I'm not sure how many. They, I'm not sure how many bodies they held at the time, but yeah, they did hold a good few bodies. Yeah, there, yeah. Was, there was two rows of them. Right. Okay. Wow. Um, and then the, the, the clothing worn by the deceased was hung alongside them, and then there was cold water from the ceiling uh, dripping down on the bodies and trying to slow down decomposition. It's so fucking dark. <laughs> it's really dark. Yeah. I mean, it's and, fascinating. Though. Yeah. People, they really saw this as a type of entertainment. Um, In 1886, a four-year-old girl was found dead with a single mysterious bruise on her hand. And after seeing it in the newspaper, readers, they rushed to see the body of the girl who was posed in a a tiny dress behind the glass in the morgue. And over the course of a few days, over 150,000 people had visited the morgue just to catch a glimpse. Because of a dead girl. Yeah. That is so... It's messed up. It's messed up. And if, if visitors, if if they were lucky, they could also potentially witness a criminal investigation firsthand. Ooh. So law enforcement, they frequently brought individuals suspected of murder to, to the morgue, hoping that, you know, confronting the victim's bodies would elicit a confession by shocking the suspects with the reality of their actions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it was literally, it was like some sort of macabre theatre, which apparently is still being used today with the pyjama girl putting wow. her on display, freezing her. Yeah. Her, yeah, mad. That's interesting. Mm. That's, man, that, that's so dark. And that just makes me think of like, it's so gothic. I mm. just like, it's gothic as fuck. Yeah, it's such like did. dark tourism. Yeah, yeah real cool. dark yeah. tourism. Yeah, imagine people in like the 1800s with their little fancy clothes on and this like very dark cave area yeah. looking at dead bodies. And they did, like, they used to go off on the weekend. Like, so, as I said, it was just something to do. And yeah. people would like, there were some visitors that would go when like, you know, it might have been a slow week in the yeah. morgue and they were, they'd get pissed off if there was no bodies there. Uh, yeah, I suppose it kind of makes the Paris catacombs, the, all the skulls and shit they have down there, like mm. along the walls and they're obsessed with death and all this like Yeah, oh. Paris was real morbid, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So slowly but surely, the Agassini line of inquiry faded away and was, was ruled out. The investigation faded into the background as life went on and the tragedy, the tragedy of the pajama girl became a spooky story told among locals. In spite of their best efforts, even preserving the body in formaldehyde and a zinc bathtub for a more permanent display, no more names were popping up. One Hail Mary was to track every single woman aged under 40 years old that had failed to vote in the elections following the discovery of the body, but even this dragnet-style search turned up no new information. Though the mystery grew, interest faded, and over 10 years passed by, without any developments. Then, all of a sudden, suddenly, uh, as they say, uh, (laughs) this is so fucking stupid, Uh, everything was just magically solved. And the case (laughs) was tied up in a nice little bow. Magically. Heavy, heavy on the magic, folks. (laughs) Okay, so, so this is what happened. And it's very believable. In March 1944, Police Commissioner William McKay was out for dinner. Right? Big dog police commissioner out for dinner at a very hoity-toity Italian restaurant in town. At dinner, ooh, he got a weird feeling on the back of his neck. He noticed one of the waiters in this restaurant was acting, frankly, a little odd. It's like, what's going on with that guy? You right? McKay then asked him his questions. Where were you September 1st? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tell me your name. And the waiter said, all right, you got me. I'm the guy who killed the pajama girl. (laughs) It was his wife, Linda Agassini, the whole time. As a result of this very sudden confession, Linda's dental records were checked again, and this time, if you can believe it, the long dead corpse had lost a couple of fillings, and the records, they now matched. 
Wow. That's convenient. That is, it's, isn't that, that's just the most convenient darn thing of all time, <laughs> isn't it? The, she, the corpse just happened to lose fillings, and yeah. this man just happened to admit to it in the middle of a crowded restaurant. Give that commissioner a medal. Case closed. The waiter was Anthony Agostini and was apparently admitting that he'd accidentally killed his wife, Linda, after the two had gotten into an argument. Somehow, he'd accidentally shot Linda in the throat and, and killed her. Even though it's believed that didn't kill her. Yeah. He panicked, discarded her body in a culvert where he was hoping the fire would render it unrecognizable, but the rain ended his plan. He didn't think it was going to rain, but it did, and hence why she was found. Tony Agostini was an Italian-Australian who had married English-born Florence Linda Platt in a Sydney registry office in 1930. Linda moved to New Zealand at just 19 years old before later moving over to Australia, where she later met Tony. Oddly enough, when McKay fingered him for the crime... He did what the first crime? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Bend over, pal. Uh, Tony had only just returned to Sydney after spending four years in internment camps. McKay had almost certainly been aware of Tony as he frequented Tony's place of work, the restaurant, on many occasions before Tony was sent away to have his politics corrected. Now, <clears throat> to say the wrap-up was convenient for McKay, it's a bit of an understatement. McKay was facing rumors of corruption. <laughs> he was facing, I love this, he was facing rumors of corruption, so he invented a solving the case. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was him. It was him. <laughs> uh, guess what? You'll never believe her, her fillings just happened to fall out. This is mad. And then he also confessed to me in a restaurant. It's crazy. <laughs> Wild shit, I know. So yeah, he was facing rumors of corruption and was looking very likely to be booted from his position and he really needed a win right there and then when he single-handedly, just so happened, fucking Azor Tikal solved the biggest and most public murder mystery of the day. McKay, he wasn't used to being praised in the media and it was far more common to read that the police had messed up, but suddenly that was all gone and he put a big fat green tick next to a whole bunch of red ink. And like that, the slate was clean. Big Dog McKay was back in town. So, sounds a bit too good to be true. It definitely sounds very, very much too good to be true. Um, it was pretty widely known that Linda Agostini had a not insignificant drinking problem and was always up for a party time. Obviously, being married to Tony wasn't exactly conducive to the wild and free lifestyle Linda longed for. So the two would regularly clash, sometimes violently. Tony gave this as the main reason for the argument that spilled over into Linda being shot dead. Apparently, Linda woke him up with a revolver in the face and the gun had gone off as they struggled for it. Naturally, there was several huge discrepancies between the scene, the body, the known facts and what Tony Agostini said in his confession. In his statement, admitting to the killing, Tony said that he'd poured petrol over his wife's body, but it was actually kerosene that was used to start the fire. He said it was a revolver that had shot her when it was a 22, which is a much mm. smaller caliber. He also said that the gunshot was what killed her, and he didn't mention the extreme beating that she had actually received that had likely killed her. That could just be to cover up being a wife beater. He, didn't, he was happy to be known as a murderer, but didn't want to be known as a wife beater. <laughs> oh, I'd shoot her, but geez, no, I wouldn't beat her. Yeah, or it could I'm also not, be... I'm not a monster. He's, yeah, he's not a bastard. Um... Or it could also be the fact that he just didn't know the details in the case because he did not actually do it. Mm. So whether it was Linda Agostini, we don't know. People identified it as Linda, but the dental records didn't match mm. until they did match, yeah. miraculously. Yeah. But Linda's still missing. Like, his wife's still missing, right? I don't know. Or did he even have a wife? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. You tell me. Even with the monumental amount of reasonable doubt, Tony was eventually extradited to Melbourne to stand trial. He was actually acquitted of murder, but found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, for which he just got six years in prison. Adding more fuel to the fire, Tony wouldn't even serve that, being released and deported back to Italy in 1948 after just three years in prison. Tony died in Italy in 1969. And that is where we finish it. Officially, the case is rubber stamped as closed, but the reality might be very different. Because at the end of the day, the dental records never matched until they did match. And the case was closed a little too easily with so many discrepancies between what Tony said and what actually happened. We may never know for certain who the woman in the pajamas was and what really happened to Linda Agostini. There you go. 
Mm. I guess wherever it was, the girl in the pajamas, it's still such a good like F you from beyond the grave. Yeah. So the, the killer is trying to dispose your body and have it hidden, and now your face is literally frozen in time. And yeah. Your face plastered out, haunting you. Forever. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it's 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 really really weird. I mean, I mean, even just reading up here a little bit more, the pajama girl had brown eyes. Agassini had blue, different uh, bust size, mm. um, different shapes noses. Uh, there's a lot of that was a completely different person. <laughs> exactly, I'm pretty sure it was a completely different person. It was this and close. by the way, do you know the pajama girl was known to be a head turner? Right, that's yeah. what they were saying. She looked yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Looking at a picture of Linda Agostini right now. Not going to be mean, but she's no head turner. Right. Let me tell you that. She, I mean, there you go. Let me see. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> not for me. No, not mean, but you know. Yeah. Someone. Yeah, she's she's a person. Uh, I hope she's happy. Not mean. <laughs> yeah. Not mean. Um, but uh, yeah. So who actually knows what happened to Linda? Who knows who the pajama girl really is? There's, there's been some other suspects, but uh, none have ever really been strong. Like, Linda was always the strongest until it was pretty clear it wasn't her. So who knows? Who knows mm-hmm. what really happened? I mean, the, the case is officially closed, but uh, it smells like horseshit to me. Absolutely, 100%. Good mystery. It's, it's a good mystery. Two, two it good is mysteries. an interesting one. Yeah, yeah they're two yeah. good mysteries. Uh, two fascinating ones. Um, yeah. There you go. That's mm. this whole episode of the that chapter. next episode. Of course, will be a back to a regular one story one. But mm-hmm, probably mm-hmm. just do something a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For this whole episode. Um, and yeah. All right, Keith. Uh, final thoughts, I guess, as we um, as we end this whole one. Final thoughts. Mm. Keith uh, time. K- Keith time. Keith time. Keith error. I don't know. I'm just uh, yeah. I'm mad. Just I'm still kind of digesting what we went through there. Uh, still trying to figure out if like it's just. The Agostini one? Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's mad. It's a real head scratcher. Yeah. I feel yeah. like it's, it's a real rabbit hole. Yeah. For sure. I think I'm going to, like I said, like going to let it simmer and digest it. I might come back to it myself a little bit yeah. later and just kind of look at it again with fresh eyes. But it's, yeah, it's, bit, it's mad. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. It's yeah. Quite a, love, I, I love a good mystery. You do love a good mystery. Mm. You know what, Keith? You're the biggest mystery evil. Um, <laughs> well, you mystery that's been solved by the folks on Reddit. So there you go. There we go. Um, Get all right. them on the case. Yeah, exactly. They can fucking solve anything. But, uh, all right, folks. Thank you so much for listening. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to Keith. I know mm-hmm. it does. He Absolutely. He tells me with his eyes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, listen, new episode of the That Chapter podcast is out every single Monday. So set your alarm clock, bitch, and check it out. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But until the next one, please take care of each other and yourselves, because I love you. And I'll see you. All right. Thanks, guys. The process is called Thanatoproxa. No, the process is called Thanata. Oh, my God. The process is called Thanatopraxy. Yeah. Let me try it again. <laughs> the process is called Thanatopraxy.